and a very warm welcome to Sympathy Lab. This is our second edition of panel discussions where we enhance conversation approach for shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder solutions within the industry. I'm happy to have in our second edition guests from our physical appearance here in the studio, but also remote. I'm talking about collaboration and cooperation. How can we proceed? My guests are today, today here in the studio, Mr. Timo Perschke, sustainable business developer, brilliant mind and game changer within various fields of play in the outdoor and apparel industry. Hello, Timo. Hello. <laughs> nice to be here and uh, super proud to be next to Rüdiger, who is one of the most disruptive thinking guys I ever met in this industry. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. <laughs> I do. I, I go, still <laughs> you go for the moderation. Textile activist, CEO of Sympatex. Very proud to have you both here. Especially proud to have the, yeah, how could I, the, the official title on LinkedIn, Charles, a specialist in performance sportswear design and sustainable matters. But whenever you do lectures, whenever you enter a room for mm. uh, whatever you share, it's a different atmosphere. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Frederick Ekstrom, he or you are a brand marketing communication consultant, um, being not only disruptive in bits and pieces of your work in various fields of play and in different industries, but also known for collaborative marketing and communication roles. So to, to make sure that we are now online and in line and with our mindset, I would love to ask my participants of our round table to tell some words why they are here, what their mindset is and what they stand for in their personal and business role. I would love to start with you, Timo. Please tell us who you are. Yeah, my name is Timo. I founded a few companies, sold it, um, worked on the uh, circle we want to discuss today. And I'm here to talk about a little bit about the education and that my biggest achievement would be if my own two kids will avoid my mistakes. Thank you, Timo. Rudiger. Yeah, hi, guys, Kim. Um, I think the main reason why I'm here is I'm in search. I believe with our economic models we have led so far, um, we have reached a point of singularity where the rules fundamentally change. And, and now we have to figure out how those new rules actually work and actually what are those rules. Um, and so that's my quest. So I just love debating with people and see how we can progress together in figuring out what's the new thing beyond the old economic thinking we had so far. Thank you, Rudiger. Handing over to you, Charles. Hi, I'm a staff member at the Royal College of Art in London. I work in a school of fashion and textiles, and I have the luckiest job in the world. I get to teach the next generation the subject of performance sportswear design, something I've done for a couple of decades now. But my most visible role in the industry is that I end up moderating a lot of discussions at specialist ingredient trade fairs, but I'm most proud of being a member of what's called the Do Lecture Team, which is just one of those big cranial festivals. But yeah, I'm just a lucky guy who gets asked to do things, and I get to listen to people like Rudiger and Timo and Frederick and learn from them. Thank you, Charles. Handing over to you, Frederick. Thank you. So... Yeah, I'm really happy to be here and I'm, uh, I'm running my agency about the clouds in Sweden because I believe that in this gaping void that the consumers are now with the lack of trust in institutions, we can see that brands probably, they probably never had more opportunity and responsibility to act as culture and sustainability role models. And I work with helping brands to, as a specialist, to transforming research and insights into actions to inspire brands to do good. And what makes me tick is when I can 
work with a brand and get them to understand that the sustainability journey is one of continual reflection and improvement rather than a quick fix. So it's a long-term process that must exist well beyond their own brand's life cycle. And when um, you get the feeling of the excitement of working with a brand when they understand that and they start changing the system and challenging their own structures and actually start doing something that could be uh, better for the future, it's um, what makes me tick. And I'm also happy to be here to meet all these other people and learn more. This is what it's all about, to collaborate, change knowledge and, um, and inspire each other. Thank you very much, Frederick. So seeing that this is the first of a series of webinars, which we want to host on sympathy-lab.com, it would be good to have a short recap on the first session. And of course, you all need to watch the 45 minutes of the first session and now stay tuned for the second one. But we had the same like bigger picture or holistic thing for collaboration, cooperation, and where does circularity stand in the eyes of consumers and industry experts. We learned from the participants, which were um, across and not only of various fields of play in our industry, but also with the perspective, for example, from uh, Fridays for Future activist and campaigning leader. Um, his name is Maximilian Reimers, and he more or less taught other industry experts, Markus Huppach, former CEO of um, Sport 2000, and Rüdiger Fox being here as well now, um, where, where the perspectives of the younger generation are or what they expect from us as generations wider within responsibility and business. And it was not only a conversation on democracy, it was also on legislations where it can go in terms of CO2 budgets, ban fossil oils, or how we need to talk and work together with a different attitude, not only in leadership, but also in communities. This leads me now to the second version of our exchange where we want to focus on where does sustainability and circular economy stand right now in the eyes of industry experts? What did we learn in the last, let's call it short term two years? What change can we accelerate together? And what solutions do we already know that we need to figure out in this kind of, let's call it, communication channel to spread the word? So. For the next round, before we start discussing, it would be great if we start with you, Charles. Derivations for fabrics and the textile industry from your definition on circular economy, competition versus cooperation by giving us an insight of your personal status quo and mindset. It's a good question. And I like asking people to define what the circular economy is. The the one definition that has the most credibility to me is when we monetize the waste. So in other words, everything that we have has value. Because if you look back to nature, there is no such thing as waste. So it's treating every output from a system as something valuable that we can use again. But for the part two of that question, competition versus cooperation, I'm going to go off on a tangent and reflect that within the last month, I had the opportunity to interview the lead on synthetic materials at Patagonia. Patagonia is seen as the default answer for can you tell me who a sustainable apparel company is? And when I was speaking with Pasha, he made a very strong point that pre-competitively, they are very keen for cooperation because one company on their own cannot solve all the problems. And the more people they cooperate with, the more that not only does everyone buy into the solution, but it adds to the credibility of presenting a unified industry taking responsibility for itself. Now, the textile industry itself suffers from a poor reputation. It is apparently the second most polluting industry in the world. That is actually a wrong reputation. But it's not that far off. We're certainly within the top 10. 
But to get to wrap up this question, where the circular economy comes into my field on textiles is there are two sides. We have the more responsible companies who are doing a really good job. And there's a nine or 10 stage sequence to go through with your fabric, with your garments to keep it circular, starting with revitalizing it, repairing it, washing it, resizing it, reselling, and so on. And there is the fashion industry solution, which is almost to rush to stage nine, which is to recycle the garment. My definition of the circular economy is actually to keep the original product going for as long as possible. And that's where I'm going to shut up because I've been talking far too long. No, you aren't. Not at all. Not at all. This is what uh, we love because we, as as long as you take us through the journey of your head, this is uh, the perfect way to stay tuned. So, Rudiger, can you give us, one hand, your definition of circular economy and also your derivations for textiles and fabrics, competition versus cooperation? And... And if I may, Charles, it happens really rarely that I need to fundamentally contradict you. Um, But thank you for the opening statement because I want to build on this. I believe circularity only starts when we have extended lifetime. And and for a very simple reason, um, and that is related to the collaboration part. Everything we can do to extend durability, uh, repairability, multiple usage is in our hand. So we just need to take the fundamental responsibility we had all the time. Circularity takes in when we need to try to link the end of the story to the beginning of the story. And I sometimes say, no matter how long a line is, it will never become a circle just to extend the length. But the magic is in connecting the two dots. If we just extend lifetime, we also will extend the challenge for nature to really absorb the consequences when something reaches end of life, and there will be at some point end of life. So what I believe is that the big challenge on circularity is not technical. From our experience, the big challenge on circularity is what you quoted from Patagonia is actually, not actually pre-competition, but you cannot create a circular system without collaboration. Because everybody in that circle is provider and user at the same time. And we experienced this in a circular setting like the Where to Work Consortium where we figured out that nobody can actually drive a solution if he keeps on optimizing the system for himself. So I think the whole circularity discussion actually starts in stage nine. Even though I agree with you, Charles, there will be stages before. But that's typically what's in our hand. In stage nine we need to start with a complete new mindset, which is collaborative. Thank you, Rüdiger. If you can do your derivations, Frederick, seeing it not only from the apparel brands you worked with, but in our prep calls, you said there were technology um, corporates and other ways that you were able to include into your derivation of circularity, sustainability itself, and your personal motivation. Can you sum up and bring us into your mindset, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, first I would like to address what Charles said. It's that, I mean, uh, uh, that no company can solve this. It's also one of my, um, my main beliefs in this, that the transformation to circular societies it's not a solo brand's problem or challenge. It's not a nation a nation problem or challenge. It's a planetary and, and society challenge that we all need to uh, face together and collaborate, either if you're a brand or a person or whoever you are. And I believe that brands must power up their ideas of how to challenge the old structures of having the linear system there where, where you have a start and an end and, and building this um, way of working and mindset into everything they do. Um, I work with both um, apparel brands and I have a long um, uh, history at Treetorn where I worked for six years, but now I also work with um, 
uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, eco tokens that are monetizing um, parts of the ecosystem to a CSR uh, to protecting them, um, which is like the what I see is the future of of the sustainability frontier that that will uh, kick off um, uh, the next coming years, I think. But when when um, uh, looking into this kind of outdoor world, uh, one of this uh, another thing you said, Charles, about monetizing waste is. When I worked at Treetorn, we did um, we, we um, uh, <coughs> pinpointed just that thing because we had we were making our products from um, nylon and and um, and plastic, pretty much polyester and, and nylon, mm. and we uh, had the mindset that if we need to change how we interact with nature, or nature won't interact back with us. So if we can't um, find uh, this kind of resources natural in, 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 the in, in nature, how can we find them in a semi-natural way and make uh, them come to us? So we uh, created a system where we collected and upcycled fishing nets in Korea and repurposed the nylon into new kind of jackets. Um, but we used that as a way to transform both uh, our company and the consumer to use it as an educational project. Uh, so we collaborated with retailer, used it to educate the consumer about the situation in the ocean, um, inspired our uh, design and product department to do something new and made clinics with sales team to understand what it is, what it's all about. So I think... Um, Collaboration is key if we uh, are going to uh, transform in, into um, a circular economy, both with uh, learning from each other, but also that no one can have control of the entire chain from uh, getting the raw material to production, to selling it, to using it, and then reusing it or bringing it back into the loop. It needs to be uh, a collaborative mindset in uh, through through all them. Thank you, Frederick. Um, so, seeing seeing that we will have one of our questions which will follow, which concrete examples can we have and which can we share? So, I, as I know from our prep calls, there are many more to come. So, be prepared. I'll ask you for that and the perfect bridge mm -hmm. to Timo, if it comes to retail, community building, sharing solutions of. How can um, social systems influence parts of the business and bring change to new business models? So your expertise yeah, on that. Yeah, yeah, it's not an uh, easy answer. To recap uh, a little minutes before, Charles said that he's uh, really lucky that he works since decades in this industry. I do this as well, and sometimes I'm not super lucky because today I see all the mistakes we have done in the past. And uh, there are a lot of uh, many different uh, views. And uh, I also saw your first talk, and maybe you are the Thanos of the industry. I don't know if you are familiar with him from Avengers. He thinks that uh, the whole uh, um, uh, galaxy is based on symbiosis. Yeah? And uh, he wants to change the system by deleting 50% uh, of the habitants yeah? to have a greater ecosystem which keeps everything uh, alive. And unfortunately, when uh, I look back, I started a brand called Pure, based on a, a circular model in 2007. Nobody was really interested in, and nobody was really cooperated or want to have a partnership with us. Because what we are doing or what we have done as a brand is we were talking to other brands. And no brand, from my perspective, is really uh, open to give up any advantage. And um, what you mentioned, Frederick, I do not agree 100% that nobody is able to control the whole supply chain and lifetime circle because uh, 50, 60, 80 years before, 
when the production was more local sourced, it was already available. So one of the problems we have in the circularity model is for, especially for the performance apparel industry, that it is a really fragmented and old fashioned business model. If you look who is really your fabric supplier, you have so many different uh, people in, in the line. You have uh, first uh, the guy who is providing somehow polyester pallets, then you have the yarn, then you have dyeing houses, and then you have lamination in between, and you never know exactly where it is made, came from, even if it is um, registered, even if it is um, certificated by, by different ways. So um, this is one point I would like to see um, cooperation, starting on the fabric supply chain management. Um, because the brands, from my perspective, maybe you can change my mindset, they will never collaborate <sighs> because um, their business model is to offer a worse, lovely brand. And therefore, they will not give up any advantage to a competitor. OK, thank you for your state of mind. Ross, uh, Charles, I saw you. Doing like this, Rudiger did the uh. same. <laughs> so something triggered you both. Um, I would love to see you, Charles, answering or commenting first. Well, I love working with Rudiger because he extends what I think. And whereas we might disagree about minor things, I also think it's actually fair to bring in a slightly different level to this conversation. And during our recent lockdown, we've all become aware of how we could see the Himalayas from India again because all the pollution cleared. And I now don't actually fear about the sustainability of this planet. What I fear is that if we don't talk, if, if we don't sort out a responsible attitude, the people who will suffer are actually going to be the human race. So to me, we're almost diverted talking about the sustainability of the planet. We actually need to sort out this task because it is for the, for the health of our whole species to go forward. Absolutely. So this is a very important inclusion in what you said. Did you want it to comment also? Oh, sure. You wouldn't be surprised. And, and, and as, as you say, Charles, I think I would almost top it what you said. I think we should stop about talking that there are alternatives. I think once we accept the fundamental of size of the change we need, uh, then we have a different discussion where, where I, in a way, Timmy, you said at the beginning, your advantage or disadvantage, like Charles being in the industry, I have the same, let's say, split feeling with, with my, me being only five years in this industry yeah. coming from other industries. But where sometimes it helps, I feel, is when we look where have been solutions. And if you look at the electrification of the car industry, where I was in the early years part of, um, we had a tremendous debate of the size and the exact shape of the plug. Each car provider had a different type of plug. Each car provider had a different interface for a mobile phone. So the Nokia one worked, the Apple one didn't, and the other way around. I think what we can learn from such industry, how fast that can change. And I think when we talk on collaboration, we need to really be careful in defining the space. I sometimes, even myself, do the mistake that I say collaboration is the opposite of, of competition, which is true in some sense. But I think if we fragment the discussion by saying we can still have the shining design part of the brands like before, we just need to agree on fundamental constraints within the, let's say, borderlines or the borders of what the planet can cope for. There's no harm. 
and everybody can agree. I think everybody will be relieved because we can create a level playing field. So I think what we need to really look in other industry, how actually did they do this? How did the paper industry achieve in whatever, 80, 90% collection level and recycling? I mean, we don't chop trees anymore. I mean, we do, but not to the extent for the paper industry as the paper we are reading. Aluminum. 95% recycling rate. So we can learn from some other industries and really look what are the role models and then stop discussing alternatives because they've invented it. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. So I, I would say Sorry. in this space, there, there are certain areas where we need to see, can we agree on a standard? It's probably my wording sometimes also too provocative and polarizing. There might be actually some standards we could agree on and then we don't, like you said, Charles, pre-competitive. So there's a baseline, and that's what we need to agree, and then we can keep competition on it. Um, and, and then perhaps the la last word, um, I think, perhaps, Charles, it's not actually step nine, but step one. If we look at circularity from in a sourcing position and say, what if we agree that we're not allowed to buy any new raw material for any clothing we produce, we can have a great standard. And then we find the solution from there. Before we look at end of life and have all the excuses that that happens ideally in 20 years or 50 years or 30 years. So, Yeah, the question is how, how, how do we get that <clears throat> on a concrete level and how do we get inspiring enough or not only inspiring but concrete call to action or next steps towards all possible channels we can use at the moment? Because if we see we just had a consumer conversation and we need to inform um, educate, or maybe your position was quite like straight, we need to change possibilities of consumption. You called it like give out vouchers. Give out vouchers up to the level of planetary boundaries. We, we, we leave it story. where it is because otherwise we would, we would <laughs> not accept it. story. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't kill people, I just limit consumption. <laughs> <laughs> we have different perspectives and now seeing that we have uh, somehow a channel to address persons who hopefully listen to us see us and spread the word. So if you four are now like um, accelerators for various various fields of play, architectures of the various industry settings in sporting good and apparel textile, please try to address concrete next steps, whether towards consumer, executive level, product developer, designer, or combine it. But it's your show now for some minutes to make sure that the right messages on concrete level reach out for the world. I would love to start it with you, Charles. No problem. And I'm not going to answer that question to begin with. Can I go back to something Rudiger said? Which is <laughs> I was Ru sure you do. <laughs> Rud Rudiger, I'm going to agree with you but also disagree with you. For too long, we've had pleasant conversations about getting people to be more responsible, and people have not acted fast enough or responsible enough. We've only tokenized tokenized their actions we actually need to prod them with a stick we need to stimulate them to the urgency of the situation so i like it when rudiger chucks out a really good challenge because our current method of encouraging people to do things is not working well enough and at this stage I envisage we need to be pressing all the buttons to try and get any possible solution because that then has to combine with working what solutions are going to be popularly adopted by the consumer. And we know the consumer has a default setting of being lazy, of taking the easiest option. So not only must we provide an array of solutions, but we must see which solution they're going to go for. But Rudig is going to come back to that at some time. But if I answer your question now, Tim. That would be great. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 that was, by the way, it was the reason why I chose you for answering first, because I knew you wanted to comment. <laughs> Um, it's not a problem. But if we now look at what are the individual steps people can do, the single biggest step is that we all as individuals, whether we are running companies, whether we are product developers, whether we are users, whether we're working with 
within retail. We all need to ask the question ourselves. And this is why I have such a lucky job, because I teach people and they are continually asking me questions. And the thing I like is that they will not accept the reason that I gave out one or two years ago. The questions have become more advanced each year. It's almost as if society has slipped into a, almost a groupthink mentality, where because everyone else is doing with it, it's fair to go along with it. I completely refute that. Everybody needs to ask questions for themselves so that they are happy that some progress is being made. And on that question of progress, can I remind people that we don't want to create another brilliant, sustainable company like Valde. What we want to do is we want to shift everyone in society to start moving so the really objectionable companies the people who refute that this is anything to do with them if we can get them to improve just by a couple of percent we will create a much bigger effect than we will by creating another excellent example thank you very much this directly yeah. reflects to your thoughts timo yes so and uh, if i could do something, I would pull a lot of efforts in uh, education. And also in community building. Was the yeah, yeah, yeah. Sense. And education That's... maybe is not the same level in every household, and at least in every country and in every part of the world. But what is, uh, it is worth to think about is the way the big corporates marketing themselves and how they build movements and communities. And the mindset of the smallest participants of our community, kids, is maybe the more open one we have to address for. So um, if you want to be a better soccer player, you look to the best one you see in television, yeah? or PlayStation, or whatever kids are doing today. Yeah? Then in the second step, if you want to be the coolest guy in the school, you look to the older ones. Yeah? So we need to educate people which have really influence, yeah? I will not name them influencer, yeah? um, that they will educate the next generation to avoid the wrong things. To do the right things is a little bit too big yeah? and not accessible for everybody. But to avoid the biggest mistakes is something uh, which we can do. And um, Fridays for Future is a good example how you can mobilize a variety of people from different ages, different uh, education levels on a global scale. And if the industry would be smart enough to follow this building of movement, this is an, has a an huge influence in the, uh, for the next uh, 20, 30 years. Hmm. Maybe it will not solve the problems we have to solve now. Yeah? We, we are responsible for the so problems we have, so we have to solve them. Yeah? But only to solve the problems, maybe we will not avoid other problems in the future. So we have to do it in, in two different ways. And but one is, yeah, mm -hmm. one is education. Thank you very much. Frederick, you said there were different educational programs you proceeded with in your brand consultancy jobs. <clears throat> is that something you connect on? <clears throat> Yes, um, I would like to address it also in a little bit different way, but I would like to I mean, combine brand and brand and consumer, of course, because they work, um, they dance together. Uh, and I mean, I, I work with a lot of uh, research and reports, and one of my last reports, the next sustainable consumer, that is uh, researching um, research the Swedish. Uh, consumer from a sustainability perspective. We see that 
I mean, knowledge and education, of course, it's key. Uh, it's key to know what you do and how to act. That would be the future of public school or schooling uh, the population. But we, we also, I mean, we could see in our in my report that I mean, um, nine out of ten Gen Zs feel that their environmental actions or environmental choices. Uh, disappeared into a black hole that didn't know, do neither good or bad. Uh, they they had no idea what what happened truly with with their actions. And uh, seven out of ten felt a fear of being judged by by their friends by doing the wrong decision uh, um, uh, or taking the wrong actions uh, through environmental perspectives. But in the same time, eight out of ten wanted. Um, or were impressed by people that um, taught them something new uh, about sustainability, something new and exciting. And we could see that in the report, you can see that there's some kind of like a status and status anxiety that, that goes on in, in the consumer um, the consumer's head where they, they want to do good. They all, eight out of 10 of the Swedish consumer identify them as being some kind of sustainability um, um, consumer. Either they're a dedicated pioneer, anxious activist or eco-swingers. But they don't know where the actions turn out. They don't know what's going on and they are scared of being judged by friends. So it's... Mm. It's um, both a driver and a barrier where I think brands have a really strong responsibility to act as role models and together with influencers, of course, or people with influence um, to show the way and educate and guide, but also inspire by doing it in an in a inspiring and fun way. So they engage with it and, and, and take them to their hearts because... Another thing that is scary is like when we ask them what words they were the most tired of hearing from brands, it was climate neutral, climate positive and sustainability as the number one, number two and number three or most tiring words. So it's they want to do good, but the more the brands communicate uh, from greenwashing brands, probably uh, the less they trust it and they feel insecure and they need the. Uh, to be guided by role model brands, I think. Very interesting, Frederick. Thank you very much for this input. And I think we will afterwards, like kind of show notes, publish everything you were referring to right now. Um, Rudiger, getting back to what we said now, it's, it's quite long answers mm -hmm. now, but we had um, Charles saying concrete steps are better than best practice examples in these mm -hmm. lectures. And I know that you definitely take on that, also on follow movements parallel to solve problems, kind of parallel visions. And um, of course now all these consumer insights from Frederick. Mm -hmm. The basic question was how concrete can we go to reach various levels? Maybe you can find like the closing words on that one. I don't know if I can find the closing words, but I think we can relax. Um, and, and before I, I explain this, I first of all, uh, and, and this is probably on behalf of the three of us, Charles, I so much enjoyed uh, the, the way you talk because you are a master of the Shakespeare's uh, mother tongue. And I think English is the only language where you can put the notion of stimulation and the use of a stick into one sentence. Uh, and I don't think that's related to the uh, English education principles. Um, but I think that's where the conflict is. We're discussing always between stimulation, motivation, change, and on the other side, the, the, the stick, the punishment, the law, and everything. I think there's a, a third part we could look at. And, and that is, for me at the moment, that gives me a bit of hope. It might just happen anyway. Because when you look, and, and, and Charles, we were playing on step nine, step one, uh, but what is amazed to me is that in the last 12 months, so many CEOs committed to a recycling commitment on their raw material, which is fantastic. Um, but as in many other industries, change doesn't happen out of commitment. 
And especially if the commitment accumulates, it induces bottlenecks. And what uh, my forecast would be, if you add them all up, there aren't enough bottles. Bottles will become a bottleneck in our industry because all the commitments on recycling, which are public, so people will measure companies and brands on it, is built on the assumption that there is enough waste bottles to go back into yarn. Now, if that bottleneck becomes a bottleneck, and that's my forecast because Coca-Cola is the biggest uh, consumer of, of packaging material by far, has committed to a 50% recycling quote, they will use their own bottles for recycling. And that, in my view, is my forecast, will be the trigger for, first of all, a huge shortage, an explosion of raw material prices of recycled materials, and we see it coming already now, and then a massive shift of what you said before, that we actually will price, or the, 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 the waste will become a, a valuable asset, and that will be our waste from the textile industry. So it might be that we need to observe, besides, while we're talking on stick versus stimulation, there might be actually something we should closely observe that by all the cumulative commitments of the size of our industry, nobody has yet looked at what bottleneck will emerge. And that's definitely the raw material assumed to be usable for yarn. So it could actually be, we can just relax, it happens anyway. And that's not a forecast, but there's actually some likelihood that circularity is the natural outflow out of a huge shortage in recycled material coming up in the next 12 to 24 months. Okay, thank you, Rüdiger. So seeing at our time scale and where we wanted to end up is right now. So I know you, Charles, um, nodding, saying, okay, I need to comment on that. I would allow all of you some like last thoughts on this in terms of one or two sentences and then we stop and give this round more space of discussion in our sympathy lab because that's why it's there for. But we want to stay sharp, we want to stay to the point and this is why um, maybe Frederick, some like thoughts on what Rüdiger said and closing down what your thoughts are would be great. Um. <laughs> You do not I need to. So. You are just the opportunity. You do not uh, need. To. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but I um, I totally agree with that. Uh, recycled material will be um, in shortage of when when everyone everybody tries to create a quick fix uh, in their system just to say that we can't change our system. We just just bring in some recycled PET in, in, and make it out of that that will just build up a new problem uh, in the end, I think, when, when everybody turns to something quick and easy. But uh, I think that um, the ongoing transition for brands is when they see the true value of actually changing what they do. And it's that if we continue to exploit the earth, we won't have any more material to do our products from and brands can't survive. It, it's, they, they need to see how it all works in the ecosystem and how you bring something to the table, you take something from the table and it all goes round and round and creating something that is greater. Um, when brands understand that, I think um, that would be when the change is, is really, really coming, either if it, it's a quick PET recycled exhibition or not. But I think that also my, my last um, word to put on the ag agenda for brands uh, to change or people also is that sustainability is not about being perfect. It's, a, it's about doing stuff. And, and and continue do them uh, over and over again, change bit by bit, piece by piece, and not be scared of being judged who you are today as long as you're transforming to something better uh, in tomorrow. Because no one can start the journey being perfect 100%. But uh, if you have a North Star that guides you towards the right direction, you would probably find uh, a brighter future. As in life, Frederick. <laughs> <laughs> Charles, 
Your last words on this. Um, people are inherently good people and they want to do good. Now, we are in an, in an information age and people, if correctly educated or corralled, will do good. But we're in a strange situation with sustainability that the technology and our education of the effects is still continuing. So I have great faith that people put their trust in the brands to help them but it's an individual responsibility that is required. Thank you very much. Is there anything you can put in two or three words? Two or three words, yeah. Two or three sentences. Um, I, I, I was I, told I only agree two or three to, words. I agree to, uh, <laughs> to the last both standing, but I still need to come back to uh, this word sustainability. And Frederick mentioned that it's maybe already overcooked here and there. So... And nobody is holy. Yeah? So you have also to divide sustainability from there is climate change and action on one side, then you have environmental friendly things, then you have diversity of animals, then you have uh, all these uh, fair wedges inside. So it must be simplified to educate the people right. And then the uh, industry has the choice where they can change their behave rapidly because you cannot change everything today, but you can pick up the biggest mistakes you do and stop it. And uh, therefore, you need to classify all these small parts which are in this big word, sustainability, and uh, yeah, that's it. Two, Thank you very words. much. <laughs> so if everybody is fine for this now, we close our round. We are looking very forward to Sympathy Lab third edition very soon. We live and breathe what is up in the industry. So share your thoughts with us, share your comments and um, feedback on the sessions you see. Thank you very much, Rudiger. Thank you very much, Timo. Thank you very much, Frederick. And thank you very much, Charles. And thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.